Good morning. Today is Thursday, April 14th, 2019. The Housing, Health, Energy, and Workers' Rights Committee will come to order. It is 9.33. I'm Teresa Mosgueda, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by Councilmember Gonzalez. Um, very excited to have you here. Also co-sponsor of some legislation that we'll be considering today. We have two items on the agenda for today, all focused on workers' rights. The first is a discussion of the hotel employee issues, and the second is a discussion on paid sick and safe leave time for Seattle School District employees. Very excited to have with us the Honorable uh, School Board Member Zachary DeWolf to talk on, on a section related to that issue as well. Uh, we're going to start with public comment, and as a reminder for those who are in the audience and our viewing committee, our viewing public, uh, there will be two minutes accepted for each person who's here to speak. We would like you to begin your comments as usual by introducing yourself and the item you wish to speak to. There was some confusion in the last few meetings about what our council rules actually say about public comment, so I want to use this opportunity to clarify. According to our public comment council rules, item three, council committees shall accept public comment at a standing and select committee meetings. Public comment at committee meetings shall be limited to matters within the purview of the specific committee item or listed on today's agenda. And the pres presiding officer at the committee meeting shall ensure that all public comment is accordance with rule 6C3A. Just to clarify and remind folks. So the first person that we have here to speak is um, Mr. Zimmerman. Your time has started. You have my dirty Führer. Uh, 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 Nazi pig from Animal Farm. My ma name is Alex Zimmerman. I want to speak about hotel worker problem, what is we have right now. Yes, all my life I'm fighting against discrimination and sexual harassment. <laughs> and because my experience is extremely big, you know what it means. So I can uh, sh sh share share my uh, information uh, uh, about my experience, what is absolutely identical, what is how this hotel working. I have a uh, discrimination in sexual harassment from this chamber every day for many years. And who gave me this? A woman, like Gonzalez, like a virus, or like a, a, a mosquito, you know Please what keep your mean? comments specific to items oh, exactly, on the agenda. Exactly, absolutely. I talk about sexual harassment. Regarding I, hotel I, workers. I have experience with sexual harassment care in this chamber. I give you my experience, so you're supposed to be uh, support these people, you know what is mean who work for hotel, because what is happened here in this chamber is only show how deep sexual harassment and discrimination we will have. So this three women is all only brown, is all Catholic, and this all Madam concept. Chair, I don't so think that this, this public testimony is relevant to an agenda item. Mr. Exactly. Zimmerman, you've been warned. No. I give you my experience. You know what it means? This in this chamber. So when this chamber we have our time a discrimination up. and harassment, uh, so we need to do something big about this. Mr. Zimmerman, I warned you to keep it two items on the agenda that was not a public comment related to the items on the agenda. Your time is up. The next person that we have to speak. I support this. Thank you. Um, the next person that we have to speak is Charlie Lampom. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Charlie. Uh, our friends from Martin Luther King County Labor Council. Okay, if we see them come back, we may go ahead and let them know they were called. And if they have a few minutes they'd like to share, we will do that. Anybody else here who would like to share something specific to today's agenda item? Okay, great. Um, so we will close uh, public comment for today. Thank you very much, sitting in Vice Chair Member um, Gonzalez, for oh, your yeah. help today. Of course. Uh, let's go to the first item on the agenda. The first item on the agenda, Faride Cuevas, could you read into the record for us? And while she's doing that, could we have our friends um, who are going to be participating in today's conversation, Abby Lalor and um, some of the workers from the hotel industry, join us at the table. Agenda item one, hotel employee issues for briefing and discussion. Welcome, come on up. Yeah. 
Antonio, are you going to be translating today? Okay, very good. So for our viewing audience, we also have Antonio Rufin, who's going to be consecutive interpreting for one of our panelists today. Hola y bienvenidos aquí. Estamos aquí a hablar con ustedes hoy sobre el tema de um, su trabajo en, um, en hoteles. Y gracias por la presentación que vas a presentar. <laughs> Y si quieres hablar en español, está bien, porque nosotros pueden, podemos entender, pero por la gente que está mirando por televisión, vamos a traducir de nuevo. So, thanks um, so much for being here to share your stories. Uh, I just mentioned that um, Councilmember Gonzalez and I are eager to have folks at the table who speak in various languages. We're lucky to be able to understand uh, Spanish, so looking forward to the presentation. We're still going to translate in Spanish, though, for our viewing audience at home in English for our viewing audience at home. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, thank you so much, Chair Mosqueda and, and members of the committee for the opportunity uh, to join you today. I know you had a briefing last week um, about the, the contents of the initiative that was first passed in 2016 and the current legal status. And so I think we're really hoping today to take the opportunity to talk about you know, where that law came from and the issues that were present um, in the hotel industry in Seattle, um, to, in particular, hear some stories from workers in the industry about what their experiences have been, um, but really to background, you know, why that initiative was so needed at the time and why we now need um, legislative action to make sure that those protections stay in place uh, for workers. Um, so I'll introduce the folks that are, are here with me today and also have them introduce and say what, what, what they would like to say, but um, you know, I'm really excited. They're both folks that I think can speak directly to some of these issues and also have been real leaders in their workplaces um, on a number of important um, organizing efforts that workers have undertaken over the last several years. Um, so to my right is uh, Nuris Duras, um, and then I have Min Vong to my left, and Steliano across the table. Um, Nuris, is there anything else you want to say by way of introduction? Gracias por tomarnos en cuenta y por entendernos. Nosotros estamos acá para hablar sobre los daños o las consecuencias que a veces uno tiene trabajando en los hoteles. Eh, en mi caso pasó algo desagradable con un huésped. Eh, este huésped eh, se desnudó completamente al tiempo que yo iba a entrar al cuarto a hacer la limpieza. Y yo tenía como seis meses de embarazo, yo creo. Eh, no me recuerdo muy bien. Pero fue algo muy, muy desagradable. Pero nosotros eh, yeah. en ese momento... En ese, en ese momento pues no hicimos nada, pero al siguiente día nosotros sí pudimos hablar con la unión y con las... Uh, con los managers y pues ellos nos dieron el apoyo para poder este tomar eh, eh, para poder ellos hacer algo con este huésped ellos eh, lo corrieron porque dijeron que eso no era nada apropiado lo que él debería de hacer um, uh, thank you for having me here and for um uh, understanding uh, uh, me and, and uh, ha giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here to talk about um, some of the things that uh, the events that can happen in a, a hotel uh, situation and the consequences that that can carry for uh, employees. Um, I was actually involved in a very unpleasant uh, case involving a guest. Uh, and uh, when I came to clean his room, uh, he removed his clothes. I was six months pregnant at the time. Uh, so it was an extremely difficult situation. Uh, nothing uh, really happened beyond that. Um, but uh, the following day, uh, although we didn't do anything at the time, the following day we reported the incident to uh, my union and uh, the management at the hotel and uh, got the support that I was hoping for. And uh, the guest was dismissed. Um, and, uh, but I was pleased that something was uh, done about this particular event. <laughs> Gracias. Um, Min, do you want to introduce yourself to see who you are, where you work? Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Um, if you could get a little closer. I'm working in the... Min, can you get the microphone a little closer to you? There you go. 
I'm working in the Western Hotel uh, 27 years. And then I work in the housekeeping department. Uh, housekeeping is a very uh, hot, hot job. Uh, every day we clean a uh, 15 room a uh, day. And then, what else? Mm -hmm. Stelliano, can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Stiliano. I work at MC Suites downtown. I am a banquet houseman. Uh, life, is easy. Uh, life is not easy even there, but uh, what's even harder is the medical plan. As we know, medical plans are expensive everywhere, and they are getting even funny. As funny as I saw one day a commercial on a bus, it was saying, Fixing one arm and one leg doesn't always cost one, which is <laughs> very extreme, I would say. So I, will, I have these paychecks with me, pay stubs, that show how much I have paid for last year. It was like 156.41 each paycheck for my medical plan. It's very expensive, but that's what I needed to cover my needs. And this year I changed it because it, it's very expensive for me. I changed it to a crappy plan, which is uh, like 50 something. Because it doesn't cover all my needs, but it's what I can afford right now. And for this, I, uh, I'm trying to do something because we all have our, our medical problems. I am alone, I don't have someone else to have a medical plan to cover me, so I have to cover myself, and uh, I would like something to change. Thank you. Thanks. And I should also say we have Natalie Kelly here, who's an organizer with Unite Here at Local 8, um, a worker organizer, and um, may also jump in with some stories that, that she's heard from, from workers about these issues. Um, I guess we, with that introduction from folks, we can kind of get into the, the different um, subjects under the initiative um, and want to say thank you, too, to the folks who were able to join us last Friday at the library um, to hear um, additional stories from our members. We had about 50 uh, Seattle hotel workers in the room that night, and I thought some really powerful stories about the issues covered in the initiative. And a, a PowerPoint we'll go through uh, today that was originally designed for, for that meeting. Um, so I apologize, the, the font is very fun. <laughs> um, but um, uh, just we'll hopefully... Quick. I just want to welcome Councilmember Herbold. Thank you for joining us as well, an additional co-sponsor of the work that we're doing here. Um, also want to recognize, thank you for the invitation, thank you, uh, for the invitation to the event um, last Friday. I know Councilmember Herbold's office was represented, Councilmember Gonzalez, myself, and Councilmember O'Brien had a chance to attend as well. Um, so thank you first and foremost for your members' time um, and the folks who are working in the hotel industry for sharing their stories. I feel like um, we have so much more of your stories to share today at this table, and that was just an introductory comment, so we do hope to hear more um, about your stories and any of the items that you'd like to share as you go through the presentation. So with that, you know, thank you, because uh, I know it takes a lot of courage to share those stories. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, so we just did some intro stories. Um, and also, as we, we walk through these pieces, want to express a huge thanks and appreciation to Puget Sound Sage for the research work that they've done over many years around the hotel industry in Seattle. Uh, first in 2012 in their report, um, Our Pain, No Gain, and Our Pain, Their Gain, um, and more recently through their publication of a survey that our members work to do of uh, workplace injury and sexual harassment in downtown hotels. Um, I think both of those are, are really important resources and would be happy to provide those to council after this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just two, two important background points to make as we talk about these issues. Uh, first, the hotel workforce in Seattle is majority people of color, majority immigrants, um, and housekeeping departments in particular, overwhelmingly female. 30% uh, of Seattle hotel workers are Asian Pacific Islander, 15% black and African American, and 16% Latino. Um, and a substantial majority of workers in the industry don't currently have the benefit um, of a union contract. Um, and I know you did some history last week, but I think those were sort of the background conditions uh, for in 2016, our, the ballot initiative that was passed uh, with 77% of the vote to um, create some additional protections around uh, workload and workplace safety, around sexual harassment, around healthcare access, and around job security. Um, 
So we'll, we'll get into workload. Um, in 2012, when Sage is looking at these issues, they found that hotel housekeepers had a higher rate of injury than coal miners or construction workers. I went back in preparation for this to see if that still held true uh, a number of years later, and it does. Um, hotel housekeeping uh, more dangerous than you know, occupations, that I think there's uh, you know, definitely a public perception of being uh, more dangerous work. And um, yeah, I would love to turn it back over to Min to have her talk a little bit more about the work that she does day to day and then her experience of um, the impact that that has had on her body. Um, Min, can you talk a little bit more about um, your, the work that you do um, every day when you go to work, what you do? Uh, what would you like me to talk? Like, um, I have to clean the skin and brushing. Just when you go into work, what do you do during your shift to clean the room? It's okay. <laughs> so, mm. in making the bed and cleaning, just talk through, describe your job. When you're starting? What, what do you work when you're starting? Yeah. In our department, every day we uh, a housekeeping clean every day 15 rooms. Uh, when we have a ladder check out, and then we are ready rushing, rushing for finish the room, and then. Well, when you have a lot of checkout, you have to make more time for cleaning the room because uh, everything you have to complete clean when the guest checking in. What else? And can you talk about when you hurt your your shoulder? Yeah, when when I was uh, rushing the the room, I got a lot of checkout, and then when I lifting the bed, I get an injury in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then what else is it? And then what did you have to do to get better from your injury? And then after that, I stay home. And then I working light duty for two months. And then after that, I stay home. Mm -hmm. And then and then I take a, a rest and I getting better. I return to four thirty work. When I go to the uh, chiropractor for 15 time for my chiropractor doctor, and then after I'm feeling better, and then I go back to full thirty work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us, nurse, for you. Um, may I say something really quickly? Min, I just want to say thank you for um, sharing your story. Gracias por compartir um, su historia. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that that this is somewhat of an uncomfortable environment. Um, I don't feel comfortable here very often, <laughs> if it makes you feel any better. So, I got a very hard time to, to say for something. <laughs> yes, you're doing... I just try uh, how much I can, I can share with everyone when I work in the, in the hotel. Yeah. Yeah. And thank I just, you. I want to thank you for that. I, I want to, <laughs> I just, I know that this is sort of a weird um, space and environment because it's very formal and official and um, and it's you know it's important to us make sure to make sure that we have real people joining us in chambers to talk to us about some of these issues and I just um, I want to thank you for for sharing your story and anything we can do to help you make make you feel comfortable you let us know thank you <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> and Naris is there anything you would want to add about your experience uh, doing the work of housekeeping and cleaning pues, um, como ella dijo, es algo muy difícil, muy duro. Apenas tengo tres años trabajando en limpieza de hotel, pero yo siento que es algo súper pesado. 
Eh, nosotros somos unos de los aventajados que nos tratan mejor que en los otros hoteles. Um, it is really hard work. I've been uh, doing this um, barely just three years. It is extremely heavy work. Uh, we just happen to be lucky that um, I have an employer who actually looks after us. En, en el caso de nosotros, uh, si son 10 cuartos checados, no están nada más 13 de llover más, son 13 cuartos en el día. Y si son checados, nos dan nada más 11 para las 8 horas, que está mejor que en los otros hoteles. Esa es una de las motivaciones de que a mí me hace querer participar en las reuniones para que los demás también tengan los beneficios que nosotros tenemos. Um, the number of rooms that I have to clean varies depending on whether the guests have been uh, checked out or not. Uh, it varies between uh, 10, it could be up to 13. Uh, ordinarily, it's about 11 rooms in, eight hour, in an eight-hour shift. Um, it's still better than many other hotels, but one of the reasons why I want to be here is to help uh, or to speak for other people who are not as fortunate as I am. Eh, en el hotel a veces dicen, ah, pero tú estás joven, pero que esté joven no quiere decir que no me duela y que no me sienta cansada. Hay días que son tan agotados porque eh, si son diarios, diarios, 11 cuartos checados, cuando viene a ser el día que descansas, tú estás molido o llegas a tu casa y quieres dormir porque es demasiado el cansancio. Y tengo compañeras que han trabajado ahí durante 40 años y están sus cuerpos totalmente deformados, sus hombros, sus dedos, sus rodillas están, hay unas que están así como inflamadas, gruesas, de tanto de encarte, y digo, en realidad hacen un trabajo muy duro. So it's a really um, hard work. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm told, well, you're young, you can handle it. Um, and uh, it, that really makes really no difference and shouldn't be a factor. Uh, after you uh, have to clean 11 rooms, you are absolutely uh, destroyed. Um, it's, it's really, really a lot. Uh, I know um, some people who've been doing this for 40 years, and their bodies really show, show it. Uh, they, their bodies are uh, often you know, deformed by the stress. Uh, the, their shoulders, their fingers, their knees, uh, knees especially, get really swollen. Um, so it's just yeah, tr really hard work. Just to, to pick up on a few of the pieces that Nurse mentioned in the, the survey that we did of housekeepers in Seattle hotels, 97% uh, reported pain as a result of their work. Um, and for a majority, they said that pain caused them trouble sleeping, made it hard for them to complete uh, routine tasks like eating, walking, <laughs> exercising, um, or taking care of their family members. Um, And uh, that pain, workers attribute both to the volume of work that they do, so the number of rooms that they're required to clean, and also the pace, the speed at which uh, those rooms are, are required to be completed. Um, they're, you know, housekeepers are typically assigned a quota, a number of rooms that they need to complete before the end of their shift, um, and that can range significantly from hotel to hotel. And there's often a lot of fear around rebuke or discipline if you don't complete your rooms um, in the time that's allotted to you. Um, and that, that stress and anxiety right, also contributes to some of the physical problems that workers are experiencing as a result of, of their workload. Um, and it's something that's damaging to overall health, and I think as, as also came up in Min's story, is uh, a threat to a family's economic security when workers are forced to take paid or unpaid leave, um, have additional medical costs, um, some of which are covered by workers' compensation, some of which are not, um, are no longer able to do their jobs because of injury that has um, you know, not only an impact on their health, but has an impact on the economic security of their families. Um, so I think looking at, at the survey results and the stories that we've heard, there was sort of a clear need for some limitation to um, the overall work that's being assigned to housekeepers. Um, I'll stop there and see if there's any questions on, on workload or on the, the stories that folks shared before we move into talking about sexual harassment. Thank you, Abby. And thanks to both of you for sharing your stories and for you sharing for your story earlier. Um, I want to reiterate that this is a safe place. Um, you all have your union representatives as, as well here with you. Um, but we want to make sure that you feel safe in telling your story. Uh, so thanks again for your, your willingness to um, 
you know, relive these experiences with us, we know that it's not easy. Um, one of the things that I heard that really stuck with me from the presentation last week was the conversation around the type of stress that is caused both for mental stress and physical stress and how that had induced miscarriages. I think it is a trend that we're seeing in a lot of precarious positions, um, unsafe working conditions from hotel working to um, Amazon warehouse work. We hear repeated stories of miscarriages being uh, reported and we also know that those are underreported. Um, is there, do you mind reiterating some of the stories that you've heard um, or one, the one that was shared with us from last week? Because I think as women, as people who are fighters for workers' rights and as, you know, a healthcare champion, this is also something that I think is a really important trend that we continue to expose because it is, has a direct connection on people's health and the health of women and the health of future um, babies. So do you mind um, just uh, repeating for us the story that one of your members shared about miscarriages? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, when you're, uh, there are really specific limitations about what kind of physical labor you should do while you're pregnant. Lifting limitations, I think sometimes it's like 10 pounds is the maximum you should lift. There's virtually no part of a housekeeper's job that requires lifting less than 10 pounds. And so something that, uh, that union housekeepers have fought for is a workload reduction during pregnancy. And um, last Friday, a worker from the Embassy Suites Hotel shared her story of having multiple miscarriages on the job at a job she's been at for a year. Um, she suffered a miscarriage. Meanwhile, another of her coworkers was pregnant, and while she was in her third trimester of pregnancy, was being given extra rooms every day beyond the 5,000 square foot limit. Um, and she only had a room reduction when there was an outcry of her coworkers and from her union representatives to get her workload reduced. Um, she got her work workload reduced. The woman who spoke on Friday then uh, tried again to have a baby and was pregnant and once again lost it because there was no workload reduction for her. Um, and she's, she's trying to figure out what she should do because her mother and her husband are both saying, you have to stop this job, it's really hurting you. But th this is the job that she uses to support her family. So something powerful she expresses that she knows she should quit. She knows she shouldn't do this work, but she feels like she doesn't have a choice because this is how she supports her family. Thank you for sharing that. As um, someone who also had a miscarriage last year, I know um, that it is extremely painful. And to ha think about suffering through that multiple times, especially knowing that your workload is contributing to that stress physically and mentally, um, is, is not only tragic, but it is something that demands attention and demands to be stopped. Um, so please reiterate our appreciation for her sharing that very tough story. And, um, and I think you know a lot of people can understand that pain but a lot of people could not um, imagine having the pain be repeated multiple times and have it be um, in part due to the workload. So uh, thank you for sharing that with um, Seattle as well as we think about why it's so important for not just the health of the local economy and the health of individuals' uh, stability, but the health of our population. I think it's an important critical connection, um, especially in this committee as we have health and labor connected. Um, thank you very much for the pause, Abby. Uh, any other questions, council members? Yeah, um, I have a question about um, compliance with the um, initiative um, as it um, has been enacted, despite the fact that it's being challenged. What what are we finding generally um, in hotels with compliance as it relates specifically to the square footage rule? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we've seen a whole range of different uh, approaches to. Um, to implementing that piece of the law, some of which are compliant, some of which are not. I think a, a particular piece that we um, would want to flag and think more with you about um, as uh, we think about the future of this policy is um, uh, the whether or not additional, if a worker um, cleans additional square footage beyond the limit in the law if that's something that is done voluntarily or is that something that can be required by employers. Um, I think the language in the original initiative was, was clear that that's a voluntary um, decision that a worker makes that they have the capacity to clean additional rooms. I think we saw some examples where um, in, workers were not actually given that free choice to decide that they wanted to do additional rooms um, but were, were, were told that they had to do that. 
Um, so that's a, a, a particular compliance issue we've seen that I, we would like to think about how to address. Um, okay, I guess we can move into um, talking about sexual harassment. Um, by way of background, I'll say, you know, there are a number of um, reasons that hotel workers um, in particular are at risk for workplace sexual harassment and assault, some having to do with the environment in which they work, you know, some having to do with the demographics of who works in the industry. Um, according to the EEOC, um, those risk factors include uh, cultural or language differences in the workplace, uh, workplaces with significant power disparities, uh, workplaces that rely on customer service or client satisfaction, and isolated workplaces. Um, and then we also know socioeconomic status, race and ethnicity, uh, gender identity, these other factors um, also uh, put workers at a particular risk of a workplace sexual harassment um, and assault. Um, yeah, I will pause for a second and see, Nurse, if there's anything else that you want to share um, from your experience, why, why you think that, um, one, that, that that happened to you, and then um, sort of what, what factors influenced the outcome for you. Sí, uh, yo he hablado mucho sobre este, este caso, en parte porque sé que sucede en muchos hoteles y hay muchas mujeres que no quieren hablar porque les da miedo, porque les da pena, porque no tienen un estatus migratorio, porque piensan que nos van a correr, porque uh, tal vez es el único empleo que tienen y a veces es difícil conseguir otro, más si ese no tienen un seguro bueno, piensan, debo quedarme aquí y no decir nada. En mi caso, eh, como hace un rato les dije, yo tenía um, cinco o seis meses de embarazo y yo vi que venía un huésped de desayunar y le preguntó si quiere que yo le limpie su cuarto y él dijo, sí, yo necesito limpieza, pero uh, yo voy a salir. Entonces, él dijo que iba a salir y yo voy al carro a recoger las cosas que ocupo para limpiar y le tocó la puerta una vez y él no contesta, tocó otra vez y él no contestó, pero él sabía que yo iba a entrar porque él mismo me dijo que él ya iba a salir. Entonces, cuando yo entro, él está completamente desnudo, parado sobre una toalla y le digo, oh, lo siento, regreso, regreso al rato y él me dijo, no, no tengo ningún problema con que tú entres a limpiarme el cuarto. Y yo le digo, no, regreso luego y cierro la puerta y me voy, pero... En, en, ahorita ya no siento lo mismo como ese, en ese entonces, un miedo, como un nervio, yo no sabía qué hacer y, y yo no le dije a nadie. Me quedé callada ese día eh, por unas horas, por una media hora o una hora. Eh, me fui a limpiar otros cuartos, pero yo sabía que tenía que limpiar ese cuarto porque tenía que reportarlo. Entonces, este, la compañera que está en el mismo piso dice, Nuris, alguien te anda buscando de tal cuarto, dice que ya puedes entrar a limpiarlo, que él ya se va. Y entonces, yo me quedé así, pero ¿qué hago si voy y ese hombre está dentro otra vez? Entonces, le, le hablé a mi supervisora y le dije lo que me sucedió y dijo, no, dijo, ahorita vamos a ir las dos y vamos a entrar a ese cuarto y lo vamos a limpiar juntas. Y ella fue conmigo, lo limpiamos, sí, él ya no estaba ahí, pero ella no comentó nada, ni yo tampoco a los managers, nos quedamos así nada más con eso. Pero el siguiente día, Olga de la Unión andaba ahí en el hotel este, y, y salió el tema sobre eso y dijo, ¿y ustedes no comunicaron nada? Dijo a los managers, no. Y dijo, eso no puede pasar, ese hombre sigue aún aquí, dijo, después de lo que hizo y les va a volver a ocurrir lo mismo o tal vez una cosa peor. Entonces, este, ella habló al, al jefe de nosotros y él eh, puso, dijo que eso no era correcto lo que él había hecho. Uh -huh. Olvidé que él tenía que traducir. So, I want to speak about my case because this is something that happens um, a lot, especially to women. Um, and, uh, and little is done often because they are afraid um, about many things. They are afraid that they may lose their job. They are afraid um, uh, of their immigration status. 
Uh, maybe it's their only job. Maybe it's hard for them to find another one if they are dismissed as a result of this. They have uh, little or no insurance. So usually they just simply stay and say nothing. Um, the, um, uh, in my particular event, I was, as I mentioned earlier, five to six months pregnant. Uh, and I was, um, um, I came to clean this particular room. The guest, a male guest, uh, uh, said that he was just um, back from breakfast. And when she went into the room, uh, Nuri in uh, inquired if, uh, if uh, he needed the room cleaned. And he said, yes, sure, no problem. I'm just going out. So as she went to back to the car to retrieve her cleaning uh, supplies, the, uh, the guest uh, closed the door. And so when she came back, she knocked on the door a few times. Um, uh, he would not reply initially. Um, he knew she was coming back. Um, so this was really deliberate. Uh, what happened next? Um, the, he finally opened the door. He was uh, completely naked, except for a towel. Uh, I said, um, uh, don't worry, I'll be back later. I can clean your room later and close the door. Um, uh, she continued her uh, shift, uh, had other rooms to clean, so she, um, she worked about maybe uh, another half an hour or an hour. Uh, and, um, but she kept thinking, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really shaken by this. I, I need to come back and clean that room that is in my schedule. Um, so um, what is going to happen? Is, is, are we going to have a repeat of the same situation? Um, so she, she spoke with her supervisor. Uh, and she, she said, no, this is totally unacceptable. Um, let's go back in. I'll go in with you. The two of us will uh, we'll deal with this. We'll clean the room if necessary. When they came in, the guest was already gone. And uh, so they completed the cleaning and left it at that. But the following day, the issue came up again. And she spoke with Olga, who's her uh, union representative. And, um, and she said, no, this is just uh, totally unacceptable. Uh, did you? Did you ask anything? Did, I'm sorry, did you report this event to anyone? And, and they said, she said no, uh, or I said no. Um, so uh, keep in mind, this guest is still at the hotel. Uh, and uh, this could repeat. Uh, it's, the situation could repeat itself, or we could have an even worse event. So we really need to speak with the manager, and, which they did, and the guest was dismissed. And just reiterating that last point, and you said the case was dismissed. Que nada pasó después. El siguiente día. Puedes hablar en el micrófono, por favor. Gracias. El siguiente día que llegó Olga, como lo dije, a ese mismo día ella llamó al a nuestros manager y él dijo, nuestro jefe dijo, cómo es posible que ustedes no me hayan dicho esto. Ustedes saben de que para mí, ustedes como trabajadores son muy importantes. Muchas veces se dice de que el huésped siempre tiene la razón. Y uh, en este caso yo no puedo decir lo mismo porque ustedes tienen tiempo trabajando con nosotros y para mí ustedes son prioridad. Y este, él me dijo, ¿te sientes bien o quieres tomarte el resto del día que falta, dice, para irte para tu casa o... O, o crees que necesites ir a algún lado, un psicólogo o algo, y digo, no, yo estoy bien. Y dice, el huésped ya fue sacado del hotel, a él le dijimos que no puede regresar más, y él aceptó de que él hizo algo indebido. Y pues uh, me sentí muy bien de que nuestro jefe haya reaccionado de esa forma, porque antes de yo hablar... Por mí, a mí se me ocurrió eso y dije, y si no me creen, y si ellos piensan que yo me estoy inventando algo así, porque muchas veces sucede de que prefieren correr al trabajador y no perder un huésped. Um, so the following day, um, after, after I spoke with Olga, my union representative, as I mentioned, um, we spoke to the manager um, and, and his reaction was immediately, um, you should have told me immediately, uh, how, how come uh, that didn't happen? Uh, he mentioned that, uh, or, or reminded me that, uh, that employees are extremely important to, to the business, that although it's common to say that the guest is always right, uh, in this case, the employee is someone who's been working there for a long time, who's uh, well known, 
and um, and that clearly the situation was uh, not right, and that it should have never happened. Um, he, uh, he asked if I was feeling okay, uh, and whether I would um, want to take the rest of the day off, or need any uh, professional help, uh, uh, psychological help to deal with the with the event. She said no, that that was okay. Um, he also pointed out that the guest was uh, dismissed, thrown out of the hotel, and told to never return. Uh, and, uh, and the guest, apparently uh, faced with the situation, accepted that he had done something improper. Um, so I felt really good that my boss reacted, my employer reacted in this way. Um, and, um, and, and part of the reason especially is because it's, uh, she, she feared that if she came forward with this story that she might not be believed uh, and uh, told that maybe she was inventing something, it was all in her head. But uh, in this case, she was immediately believed without question and the issue was dealt with. De lo, lo que es de mi historia, pues eso sería todo. Pero me gustaría hablar de otro tema que le sucedió a una compañera, que ella fue a tocar la puerta de un cuarto y el huésped empezó a forcejearla, a quererla entrar a la fuerza al cuarto y este, se estuvieron forcejeando por un momento y ella empezó a, como a pedir ayuda, pero no, no pudieron, no, no hallaban si empujar al huésped o hacer algo porque saben que después puede tener consecuencias, ¿verdad? O una demanda o, o algo así. Um, mi punto al hablar de esto es porque ella estaba en el primer piso donde estaba cerca de, much, de más personas y lograron verla. La policía llegó y, y lograron sacar al huésped. Pero en otro punto de vista, si a ella eso lo hubiera pasado en un cuarto piso donde no haya alguien que la ve, ahora en, en día cómo está de que andan armados o son muy violentos. Y si he, nadie hubiera habido con ella, hubiera estado en un piso más arriba, ¿qué hubiera pasado? Entonces esas son una de las cosas por las cuales también uh, nosotros pensamos que un botón de pánico sería muy bueno, pero algo que sea efectivo. No algo que solamente haga una alarma y solo suene, pero nadie te va a escuchar. Algo que sea efectivo como que pueda alguien tener uh, como la localidad o saber en qué piso estás. Um, another, uh, so, so thank you for letting me share my story. Um, this would be all, but um, uh, I also want to refer to another uh, very troubling incident that happened to uh, 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 another uh, fellow employee of mine. Uh, in this particular uh, situation, the, um, the, em the uh, employee uh, knocked on the door of a particular uh, room, and the guest, uh, another male, um, uh, tried to actually uh, pull her in. And uh, for a few instances, there was actually a uh, physical struggle between the guest and, and the employee. Uh, she cried for help. Um, and, uh, but fortunately, she was on the first floor where there were other people about, and uh, police were summoned, and, um, and the guest was um, dealt with, uh, thrown out, and, um, and, uh, and the, the issue was resolved. Uh, her concern is, is that if, in this case, she was lucky because she happened to be on an area that was uh, accessible and with uh, some foot traffic. But if she had been in the fourth floor, maybe she wouldn't have been so lucky. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, one reads about also uh, people um, being armed, um, uh, and uh, and so so the concern of physical aggression, assault is a, a very real one. Uh, um, panic buttons are good um, as an uh, and as a as a good starting point, but um, she w but I would hope that there's a, a better, a more effective uh, way of doing this. Maybe something that also notes the location uh, of the employee, another another particular, so so the right amount of help can be summoned immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. De nuevo, gracias de nuevo. Um, I, I just want to remind us we have about 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, and thank you again for uh, incorporating these stories. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, so I'll just quickly provide some some quantitative data about um, 
sexual harassment that came from the survey we did of members. We had 53% of housekeepers reporting um, some experience of sexual harassment or assault uh, over the course of their work. Uh, by far the most common incidence was being flashed or exposed to nudity um, from a guest. Uh, other workers reported being groped or cornered, hearing lewd remarks or comments, uh, being propositioned or offered money for, for sex. Um, and 51% of workers surveyed said that they wouldn't or didn't report sexual harassment that they'd experienced. Um, and again, this is also an issue of, of economic security for families. Um, according to data from the National Council for Research on Women, women are nine times more likely to quit their jobs, five times more likely to transfer jobs, and three times more likely to lose jobs because of workplace sexual harassment. Um, and 80% of women who have been harassed leave that job within two years. Um, so it's, you know, again, both a workplace safety issue, but also something that has an impact on, on the ability for uh, women hotel workers in particular to be able to support their families. Um, and I think we've, we've seen from the stories and from that data a clear need for additional tools both to prevent workplace sexual harassment and then uh, to allow workers to respond to harassment when it does occur. Um, and with that, I'll move into talking about healthcare access. Great. Um, Steliana, do you want to start us off and talk a little bit more about um, the challenges that you faced being able to access health care for yourself and your family? Okay. Not me personally, but there are some uh, people on the banquets who work on several places, on call or part time. That means that they don't get medical insurance in any of them. doesn't matter if they work 80 hours or 120 hours or more. And uh, that's an issue, too. Uh, I personally don't have that ins issue, but uh, I still have some issues even as a full-time that I am. Sometimes I don't get full-time hours at that place because the business depends on seasons depends on the weather uh, and so on. And uh, sometimes there are risks that if you don't work a certain amount of hours, you might lose your medical insurance anyway for a month or two. Or I, there's, it's complicated. And uh, I guess that's all. <laughs> Do you want to describe the kind of plan you have now? Uh, it has uh, expensive deductible. De deductible yeah, uh, I pay less and it covers less, obviously, and uh, I haven't used it yet, even though I can, I'm paying for it. But uh, it's not really what I need because I have a lot to do with my body, <laughs> and. Uh, I hope I will be okay. What is your deductible on this plan? 3,500. Wow. <laughs> wow. Deductible. And yeah. How much do you pay per month for that plan? Uh, right now it's like 54. For check? Cause, yeah, because I choose the cheaper one because the expensive one was very expensive for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an almost impossible decision, huh, to choose which health plan. I, I really like the foundation that was earlier set in the conversation around the initiative because really we know that the gold plan uh, is the best plan that folks could choose, but having to think about how you can afford that just on your own in the exchange, for example, is almost impossible. And so I totally hear you. A lot of people make the decision to pay less per month, but then if something happens and it's so much more expensive, and that's just scary and stressful. Yeah, because th there are two things here. If you don't have a medical plan in the end of the year, when you pay the taxes, you'll still pay for that's it. Right. Even though you didn't have it, you didn't use it. And there's another thing that other employees say too, that uh, if you have an expensive one, um, you will pay a lot, and you will not use it, all of their benefits. Um, I was about to say something else. I 
it <laughs> ran out of my mouth. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes Especially we... when you're live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that the thing that you're saying is really the access issue is the most important. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, you have insurance, but if it's not accessible, then it's really not a peace of mind or a safety net. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that and for bringing your example pay stubs. That's Thank very you. helpful. Yes. Um, yeah, if we look at, at Bureau of Labor Statistics data nationally about worker access to employer-offered health care, uh, workers at accommodation and food service establishments have the lowest rate of medical care access, the lowest rate of participation in plans when they are offered, um, and the, the lowest rate of take-up. Um, so it means, you know, those workers are less likely to have access to a plan and then less likely to take it when it is available. Um, I think for a lot of the reasons you just heard, either premium costs are too expensive or deductibles and other costs are so high that it, it just doesn't make sense or folks are unable to, um, to take those costs on. Um, and I think there are also, unfortunately, some real limitations to the extent to which the ACA has expanded access for workers. Um, we see challenges in particular where employers offer um, you know, minimum value plans that then mean that workers aren't able to access uh, subsidies tax credits when they go to the exchange to purchase um, either a, a higher level of insurance or insurance for their families. And so um, they're sort of stuck in this position at where the, the plan that's available to them through their employer is not one that actually creates healthcare access because the, the associated costs are too high, um, but they're also not able to get help to purchase um, a different um, insurance plan. So I think you know we see a clear need for some additional compensation for workers to be able to actually access care. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. Um, yeah, on this issue, I, um, I think that the, the value in which the provisions of 124 uh, one, um, that are rooted in improving access to medical care is super important. Um, in my reading of the um, now legislation, it doesn't seem to have a requirement that the money actually be used to purchase health care. Um, can you, and to me, it, it makes sense to try to figure out how to marry the two. Um, um, in particular, because I think that I get concerned about there being readily available money. Um, and when you are already making not a lot, it's tempting to take the money. And then uh, if there isn't an, an actual requ requirement to purchase health care insurance, then I think that the intent, the underlying intent of the law, which is to create access to health care, is um, potentially being undermined in a way that wasn't intended. So um, can, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of a potential gap there between the intent and the actual um, letter of the law? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, for you know, can, folks can disagree about whether it's fortunately or unfortunately, but I think there are um, some limitations around what um, the the city can um, can stipulate in terms of um, health care provision. Mm -hmm. um, I think the a clear objective of the original initiative was to make sure that workers were receiving additional compensation that genuinely reflected the amount of money they would need to actually go out and and purchase a health care mm -hmm. plan. Um, because if, if workers were to get an additional 2 or $3 an hour towards health care, well, that's great, but that maybe doesn't actually get them that far in terms of actually um, accessing the health care that they would need for their families. Um, so I think we certainly tried to address that concern um, in, in that the, the payment is structured to actually reflect the cost that, that folks would face um, based on their insurance needs. Um, but I think we would be very open to thinking more about on the, the worker side, what could be done to make sure that um, that folks are actually using that money to access the care. Yeah, I mean, I'm not calling into question the valuation around the, the cost of the insurance, um, but, but I do have concerns about, um, about um, making sure that we're connecting the um, amount of dollars that are being provided to workers to actually allow 
workers to be able to purchase health insurance in um, in whatever market they choose. And so I think, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think for me there's a there's there's a um, a little bit of a disconnect currently around. Um, verifying that the employee actually utilized the, the money to access health care. And ultimately, I think that's the shared goal, right, is we want a healthier workforce. It helps to address some of the work injury issues that we've been hearing stories about and that you highlighted in your presentation. Um, and we're not really truly allowing workers to address those fundamental physical mental health issues with um, insurance if the money is going to be used to purchase other stuff that meet basic needs but aren't healthcare insurance. Mm -hmm. I guess the other thing I would say is just looking at other cities that have, mm -hmm. have thought about these issues and taken some kind of action, thinking of yeah. San Francisco in particular, it sure. did involve some significant infrastructure from the city in order to um, establish a system where folks were more directly accessing care. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the um, minimum wage context, there was, you know, a slightly different kind of rubric to create um, a greater incentive amongst employers to just provide that more affordable insurance um, uh, directly to employees. And so that might be a potential for us to explore as well in terms of a model here. I'm going to do a quick time check. We have about two minutes. Okay. This last one okay. can, can do very quickly. Um, I know. I think folks tend to think of hotels as as business that make businesses that make money through operations. I think they are um, also serve um, as real estate assets and are are bought and sold uh, from that perspective. And so, um, you know, we see a pretty frequent. Um, Turnover either in the entity that owns a hotel or the entity that's operating that hotel. Often those those two are, are different entities, um, and either of those changes um, can be very disruptive to the workforce at that hotel. Can result in in folks who've had five, 10, 20 years of experience um, losing their jobs because um, the new operator wants a clean slate, wants to bring in workers at a lower wage and benefit level. Um, and uh, you know, folks, I think, have borne witness to some of the fights that our union has had um, in these situations um, to make sure that an existing workforce is able to uh, re retain their jobs uh, during a change of ownership. Um, so I, there's just a quick list over there. And, and the industry probably has better data than us on this, but this is our, our record of the, the hotel sales just in the last three years in Seattle and the number of workers impacted. Um, so I think the, the last piece of the, the initiative and the piece where we really uh, saw action needed for workers was to make sure that there was uh, uh, worker retention so that folks were able to uh, maintain their jobs, maintain their economic stability um, when their hotel was bought or sold. And I will end there and turn it back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Gracias de nuevo. Thank you once again for all of your time and your stories. And as uh, we've talked about at the last meeting, this is just one of a series of meetings that we plan to have through um, the spring and early summer. Uh, let's see if any of my colleagues have any comments before I wrap up on this section. No. No. Okay, Councilmember Herbert. I just really appreciate you um, joining us at the table and helping us craft um, good policy that replicates the initiative that y'all worked so hard on getting passed and making sure that um, the city is supporting your efforts to be um, safe and secure and have access to health care in your jobs. So, thank you. Um, I'll reiterate that again. Please tell all the folks that we did meet on um, Friday and before that um, on Christmas Eve. I think I saw a number of people when news was coming out um, about the lawsuit. So, you know, we really appreciate people being willing and able to come to the table. Again, we apologize for the formality of this, but it's very, very helpful for us to hear those stories directly. Um, just a few reminders before we wrap up this section. Uh, we are definitely interested in tracking some of the news that will be coming out, we believe, later today about the ruling on Initiative 124. Uh, we know that uh, we're supposed to hear back on the Supreme Court's decision on the appeal uh, later today, if, if um, not um, tomorrow. I think we were also thinking it might have been yesterday. We also know that some of the current protections included in Initiative 124 are not currently doing being enforced, though it's great to hear some of the good examples of some of the employers enforcing 
elements like making sure that people are getting kicked out if they are behaving poorly and harassing or intimidating, assaulting people. Um, so we are very interested in continuing to hear additional information that comes from you, from folks that unite here, from other workers that you work with, specifically elevating the voice of women, of people of color, of um, folks who are immigrants, uh, predominantly working in this hotel sector. We really want to make sure that that voice is clear and present in our conversations around, um, around the policy moving forward. Um, I want to reiterate that we are definitely going to have some of our friends from the hotel uh, sector as well come in May to share some perspective. You know, we this is part of what we did during the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights discussion. Having employers and workers at the table helps us in the end come up with really solid policy solutions. So that will be forthcoming in May. Um, and I just want to close by saying thank you, gracias, um, to the workers. Um, thank you to my council colleagues. Uh, we're working hand in hand with the mayor's office as well, um, and we'll be having additional conversations with the hotel folks, and we'll continue to engage with you as the representatives and the direct workers in the hotel industry um, to make sure that we put some very commonplace protections um, back in place and in statute in our city. So thank you. And with that, we will close this section and move on to item two. Before we do that, um, I did see that there was one other person who I called earlier, Charlie. Um, we did have a time for public comment here. I will open that up if you're still interested in making a few comments um, before we get into item number two. Um, so we are opening back up public comment for the record. Uh, Charlie Lampham from the Martin Luther King County Labor Council, welcome to the microphone. Thank you, and I'm sorry I missed it earlier. Um, okay. I'll be really brief. You know, I just came out today because um, I wanted to thank all of you um, for working on this issue. We all know voters overwhelmingly passed I-124, just like they've passed so many other worker protections because the city cares about protecting our workers, especially our most vulnerable workers. And so, you know, we all know it's an injustice that this law is being held up in the courts. And so, again, we just wanted, on behalf of the whole labor community, from hotel workers to janitors to security officers, um, we want to just thank you for, for really taking this on, writing the injustice, making sure that these workers get cemented in law just like the voters intended in 2016. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, is there anybody else who came for public comment that would like to add at this moment? Okay. That will close our public comment round officially for today. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing that. And Farida Cuevas, could you read the second item of business into the record? And while she's doing that, could I please be joined by Dave Westberg and Mike McBee from IUOE Local 609 for our first panel? Oops, I don't think your microphone's on. Sorry about that. Agenda item two, paid sick leave and time off for Seattle School District employees for a briefing and discussion. Well, thank you so much. And it's good to see you, Mr. Westberg. It's been a while. Um, thank you for being here as well. Too long, Too long is right. Um, I had the honor of working with uh, Dave Westberg in the halls of Olympia for a number of years as we worked on labor protections um, when I was with the State Labor Council. And it's a good segue. Thank you, Charlie, from the CLC for your comments around labor protections and making sure that we're protecting those because one of the things that we worked on right here in Seattle a very long time ago was paid sick and safe leave. And we know that some of the workers who are around some of our most vulnerable populations, being kiddos, um, need to have access to sick leave and appropriate and robust sick leave. So this is one of the first issues that I had the chance to talk with you about when I got elected. And I will admit it's been far too long in the making that we're getting to this day, but I'm really excited to be working with you um, to, I think, correct some uh, small pieces, technical fixes that we need to put into place to make sure that your workers are kept whole. So I invite you to uh, introduce yourself at the table here so folks have, and have your name for the record and then we'll get started. Be um, business manager. Push this button. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mike McBee, business manager, local 609. Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And if it's green, then it's on. David, <clears throat> David Westberg, retiree, <laughs> 609 retiree club. President. Really? Okay. <laughs> I just elected myself. Congratulations. <laughs> well. <laughs> Ten minutes ago, we didn't have a retiree club. Now we do. So <laughs> Good. There you go. Well, thank Dave, you for... Oh, go ahead. Dave told me uh, a couple weeks ago that although he's retiring, he's not leaving until this issue is Good. Uh, buttoned up. Okay. <laughs> well, we don't want people to jump on the bandwagon for that reason. There you but, go. <laughs> uh, 
when you believe in something, it's hard to retire. You just yeah. move on to the next chapter. And this is an unresolved chapter from um, my years with the union and uh, representing classified school employees at Seattle School District. We <clears throat> have about 650 to 700 members, depending on how many vacant positions we have in a particular week, um, that <clears throat> Our members and uh, other workers at Seattle schools don't get coverage for uh, paid safe and sick time. And you know we're not asking for safe and sick time. We're asking for a means of enforcing uh, and having a place where we can go to complain. Equal protections under the law is what we're seeking. And <clears throat> in a, and I know I'm doing all the talking so far, Mike, I'll stop in just a moment, but in an organization that's highly stratified, uh, a hierarchical organization like the school district is, that values education um, and primarily and values having matriculated in education, we sometimes often overlook uh, those people at the lower end of the economic scale. And I think that's what happened here. Um, for one reason or another, we're not uh, we're not down here often. We generally handle our own problems, and that's how we prefer to do it. Uh, however, there are times, and we've had this in the last couple of years, primarily with women, immigrants, minorities who are uh, who make up the bulk of our largest, uh, second largest group of 200 in nutrition. They get very unsettled by the way they are treated at the school district when they are. Uh, when they have serious medical conditions. Um, I can rattle off names, but I'd rather not. Uh, we didn't bring a, a group here today. They'd have to take off the job. And uh, we have not lost anybody, but we've had to call upon uh, offline workarounds, if you will, to protect uh, these women. And I have uh, f four women and one man uh, names to remind myself of their uh, stories. but. Uh, they get very upset and they're told, well, if you run out of leave, will you just have to quit and uh, resign and come back as an entry level person? And when you've worked for an organization for 20 years or more, that's not how you expect to be treated. You have some pride. Uh, one of the ladies that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> Lisa met here uh, a few weeks ago, she, I didn't get a chance to tell you, but she lives right across the street from the school. She's so proud of that little, uh, is it High Point? High Point house of hers and uh, that she can walk across the street and walk her dog. And she thought about getting back in there and getting back to work from September until uh, March 7th when she came back often. And it's hard to avoid that when it's right outside your house. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's part of it. We want to give people the incentive to over to get through medical emergencies and come back to work without the threat of losing their jobs over it. And that's, that's the problem in a nutshell. Thank you, David. Um, just for some context here, I uh, want to remind folks, this is related to an effort that's been in the works for a very long time, right? Seattle passed its paid sick and safe leave ordinance in 2012 to ensure all employees in the city have access to paid leave and time to care for themselves or their family. And really excited that our city continues to get national attention for leading the way on the sick and safe um, leave effort. We use this momentum in the initiative 1433 effort to really take st statewide the commitment that every worker should have access to paid sick and safe leave. But we also know that without adequate enforcement, uh, those words can just be p uh, pen on a piece of paper. And we need to make sure that workers both know their rights, can access their rights, and also that you have a place to go to in case those rights are being violated. Um, unfortunately, we see some discrepancy with how um, the cl classification or categorization of, si of uh, school employees are being applied in this situation. So today, we're really excited to hear from you um, as you think about uh, the, the work that's to come here. We have um, some, I think, I, opportunities to have some technical fixes to make sure that we're 
uh, applying paid sick and safe leave to the school district as well. And as you heard, we'll also hear um, an opportunity to hear from school board member DeWolf, um, who's interested in this issue as well. Um, so before we get there, though, go ahead and tell us more about what's on, on your uh, to-do list here for us and looking forward to working with you. Well, as Dave said, you know, we're, we're just, we're excited to get the opportunity to get the Seattle School District under the umbrella of the city ordinance. Uh, we think it was an oversight and uh, it's something that we can re rectify and we should. Um, as Dave said, you know, we've got, we've got sick leave, our, our members accrue, there's federal, <clears throat> federal and, and, and state uh, access that, that they can take time off, but the loss, uh, the lack of enforcement uh, is what's really hurting us. Um, there's also the ability, as Dave said, uh, we're a very large percentage minority, a large percentage immigrant. Um, the ability for the union to bring issues forward uh, on behalf of our members is lost to us at the state level. Um, and we look forward to that opportunity at the city level. Uh, investigatory processes that are uh, covered under the ordinance, uh, as well as penalties. Um, we oftentimes see the school district, see the employer as, you know, yeah, they may have to give some back pay here and there, uh, but it, it hurts when, you know, there's a finding against them. Uh, we're a small local and uh, we represent our members very well, uh, take them to you know, for labor practice, grievance, arbitration, and, and whatnot. But another opportunity, another avenue to rectify these wrongs uh, is always welcome for our members. Not every case is something that you wanna to take to arbitration, not every case is an unfair labor practice, um, but that doesn't mean that those that sick and safe time days aren't critically important to our members and the ability to have uh, an agency assist the uh, worker in rectifying those wrongs that they may be subjected to is critically important to us. Great. I do see also a representative from the Office of Labor Standards in the audience if we do have questions as well. I want to thank uh, you for being here, and you're always welcome at the table. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you just said is really important as we think about our lessons learned from labor standards enforcement, specifically around wage theft. Obviously, it's impossible to be in every industry or in every business, but just the um, ability to know that there is an enforcement mechanism to fall back on often deters um, violations from occurring. And so I think that it's not just education and enforcement, it's the fact that this will now be um, something that you can refer to. So hopefully it will be a preventative measure I love that you brought that up. Comments or questions? I just appreciate the uh, clarification that um, you are receiving, um, your, your, the, your employees are receiving the uh, legally mandated uh, uh, sick and safe leave. Um, that said, it occurs to me that um, you know, some of the exemptions in, in the ordinance were out of um, a, a, an understanding that other um, regulations were in place that required that employer to provide sick and safe leave. Um, but without the understanding um, at the time um, that uh, the ordinance served two purposes, not just to require the employer to provide the leave, but also to create the mechanism uh, for, for the enforcement locally. Um, because sometimes um, it's more difficult to um, get other jurisdictions to enforce those, those obligations. Um, so I really appreciate you guys bringing this forward. Um, I appreciated work uh, meeting uh, with the teacher at West Seattle High. Vera. Vera, manager, yes. Kitchen manager. Thank you. And um, I, I'm just wondering if there are other exemptions that were put in the law that might um, have the same, the same problem for their workforce. Go ahead. <laughs> I've looked at it a lot. I don't think there are uh, that are the same characteristics as the Seattle School District, which is wholly and completely contained within the city of Seattle. I can understand how the university or the county or you know the port, any of these things, these are en external entities to the city. Every one of our members works in the city of Seattle, and that's the point of equal protection. As far as the the 
uh, fabric of other laws. Don't get me started. But uh, the, the nature, listening to the other workers here today, the nature of this work, primarily in nutrition, where you're uh, food services, you're working uh, just the school year, you're working perhaps uh, short hours, uh, perhaps more than short, but you, there's so many pitfalls to fall through the uh, Family Medical Leave Act coverage, 1,250 uh, hours per year worked. That's a lot of hours for a school year person. Full time is 2,000, so you have to work more than half time to qualify there. Uh, Law, Washington Law Against Discrimination, a very, very stringent law that we got in Olympia here a few years ago, uh, doesn't apply to uh, dependents. Mm -hmm. So I have one lady that right now uh, who has who has an adult son with colon cancer, stage four. She's trying to take care of him as long as her leave will will last. Unfortunately, we tried to use an argument of Washington Law Against Discrimination doesn't cover dependents. And so, you know, there's a number of different pitfalls. I'm not aware of those other exemptions in the paid safe and sick time, but there's sure a lot of exemptions in other laws that need to be fixed after we do this one. And um, our friend from OLS, Office of Labor Standard, had to go, but there is this ongoing conversation about harmonizing um, at the macro level. On this micro um, example, uh, because of the narrow scope of the uh, correction we're trying to include, uh, my hope is that we will be able to circulate to you all um, draft legislation before the end of the week so that we may consider this at our next meeting um, in two weeks. Are there any other things that you all would like to share? No, that's what I wanted to ask about introduction. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, next steps. And at that m meeting in two weeks, would you like us to bring an example of one of the ladies that has been harmed by this? Um, definitely. We will follow up with you on that if that's something that folks are comfortable with. We always welcome those voices of direct workers at the table um, and appreciate union representative leaders as well because we know you bring their voice as well. Any other things you'd like to add? Well, that should cover it. Okay. Um, well, we really appreciate you being here, and we do have one more panel, so we will um, thank you, and we'll follow up with you with the legislation and the specific time in the next meeting. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank yes. Um, at this time, we'd like to welcome uh, board member Zachary DeWolf, who has been very kind to engage with us on this topic and uh, really appreciate his um, ongoing commitments to labor standards, lifting up workers, especially workers of color, uh, women, the LGBTQ community, and um, uh, immigrants and refugees. So Zachary, it's great to see you again. Good Board Member you. DeWolf, thank you for being at the table with us. Council Member Gonzalez and I um, were thrilled to have the opportunity to see you almost every other night in 2017. Um, and haven't got a chance to see you as much lately, but I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here. And go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and tell us your perspective on this issue. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Mosqueda and Council Members Gonzalez and obviously departing Herbold for inviting me today. My name is Zachary DeWolf. Uh, board director with the Seattle Public Schools, and I represent District 5, which covers Capitol Hill, Downtown, International District, Central District, Leshy, so basically the lake to the, the, the sound, I guess you could say, and then the cut to the 90 about. Um, so uh, first, I actually come to you today with some exciting news. Um, uh, last year in, 20, in 2018, in September, I was grateful to connect with some of our labor partners. Um, particularly from the Building um, and Construction Trades Council, as well as some other um, folks from the labor community to begin exploring ways that our Seattle Public Schools might um, join partners from the city, the county, the port, and Sound Transit and their commitment to workers, our communities, and mostly folks for the way, furthest away from economic justice by implementing our own community workforce agreement. Um, so last night we officially brought CWA conversations to Seattle Public Schools and we're, we will look forward to bringing more light to this with a resolution and hopefully a task force to see how CWA might be strengthened by what we see as the one resource that we have at Seattle Public Schools, which is students. And so we're trying to figure out ways that a CWA might be enhanced or supported by having that really great resource. Yeah, thank you. That's great news. Um, yeah, and as far as our um, both our 609 partnership, but all of our labor partners that that contribute to Seattle Public Schools, um, you know, they are some of our greatest ultimate contributors to our student success. And so we do strongly support our workers and unions as part of the patchwork of folks who make our school district run smoothly. Um, as I understand it, you have um, 
you just mentioned it a minute ago, there is work uh, ongoing on language or an amendment, and I think we would obviously, I would want to make sure we had some staff here, particularly from HR and finance, to be able to have some deeper um, conversations, but we are eager to work with you on ways that we might ensure our workers are supported and can really rely on their employers like us at Seattle Public Schools for support when it comes to paid sick time, um, paid sick leave and time off. So we, we are looking forward to being a, a partner in that work. Great. Um, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I also recognize that you are a different jurisdiction, so this partnership is really critical. I have really appreciated your interest in this topic and um, your interest in, I think, what we're trying to do as well, which is lead by example as public employers. I think it's really important for us to show the rest of the city um, that it is important to implement the rules as, uh, and policies as we've passed them at the city yes. level. And in fact, when we've done so, especially around sick leave and minimum wage, quite literally the sky has not fallen as people were <laughs> yes. concerned about the headline actually said that in the Seattle Times and we've seen greater economic activity so as employers I think we're in the business of showing that this is not only good for the workers but it's also good for you know the business and as public employers we need to show that this is absolutely the right thing to do and um, when we do that uh, together I think it shows a unified force so I'm really excited that even though you're in a different jurisdiction and we really can't tell you what to do um, <laughs> It's, it's really critical that we do have harmony, that we standardize these um, these uh, application of the rules. And as you heard from the earlier panel, that we're not creating carve-outs or exclusions for sure. workers in our city. So it's exciting to see you here. For sure. Any other comments? Nope. Um, Seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, I mean, you know, a lot of folks that work in our union jobs are also parents and family members, and they're right in our, our schools. So obviously we do want to ultimately support them. Excellent, great. Um, we're really excited about that, and I know you guys have had the chance to work on the implementation of the education levy recently, so it's just a continuation of this uh, strong partnership. Yes. And um, Anything else that you want to give us an update on in your, in your world at the school board? We got a lot of stuff we're working on. We just passed our strategic plan, uh, probably I would say one of the most innovative with a real strong um, centering on students of color, particularly black and African-American males, and so kind of our target universalism philosophy, we, we think we're going to do some really great work, so we're looking forward to that. Excellent. Great. Yeah. Good, good note to end on. So yeah. uh, thanks to you. Thanks to our earlier panel um, uh, from the leadership of 609, and we will be bringing this legislation forward to our meeting on April 18th. We'll get a draft out to folks to look at, um, uh, ideally by the end of this week, and then we should be able to have that on the agenda for our next meeting, along with a high-level briefing on yet another housing and land use issue, Fort Lawton. Uh, we will have a chance to have a comprehensive overview of the plan and land use proposal. Uh, and that be should be... Interested. Oh, good. Yeah. And that should be Another a pretty issue full agenda. That, <laughs> yeah. that the district cares about that we are also partnering that with them. That is true. On. Yes, we do need more schools as we consider additional density. Um, with that, uh, today's meeting, I think we'll go stand adjourned unless there's any other comments. Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you, Day, for staffing us today.